Good morning, Grace Church. It's Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday. This is, without a doubt, just the most amazing Sunday of the year for us as we remember the sacrifice that Christ made. And while this year is different because we're not actually together in physical proximity to one another, we're here together still in spirit. And that's a wonderful thing. That's an amazing thing. And I believe that God has something for us today, even though we're going to be watching in our homes and, or wherever it is you're going to be watching this. I think God's got something for us today. And I hope that today you are as excited to be wherever you are as I'm as excited to deliver this message to you. Before we get started, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, you are a good God. And you're a good God no matter where we are. And the Apostle Paul, he wrote that whatever state I am, I'm, I can be content. I will be content. And I am content. And God... God, we know that he was writing many of his epistles from prison, and yet even there he was content. And Lord, we don't have circumstances near that difficult this morning. We're not together. We want it to be different, but it's not. But God, I pray that we be content too. Help us as we're looking at your word, as we're studying this today. Give us wisdom as we evaluate what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. On this Easter Sunday, of course, we, we know that there are people who, who are interested in it in a service that may not normally be interested in a service. And so we, a lot of times we, we speak to the guests as well as to those who are, who are part of our regular church family. And, and today's message is no different than that. The first part of the message will be kind of to our guests, but I'm going to end with the challenge or with the inspiration really for us as part of the regular church family. So I want to speak to both of you today, but beginning to those who, who may not be a part of us, regular church service here I want to begin with this question, really, what is, what is Easter all about? Because that's a good thought. What is Easter all about? And of course, for us as a church, we believe in the death and the burial and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And for some, that's very far-fetched. And you wonder, why is this even possible? I mean, we're, we're thinking about Easter because, well, that's, that's the right time to go to church. We've got Christmas, we've got Easter. And those are times we just go to church. But with this whole COVID-19 thing going around right now, and really the fears across the nation... I want to think about this from a different perspective for just a second. What is it that we dread about death so much? Because on Easter, we celebrate the fact that there's a resurrection. And that gives us great hope. But why does that give us hope? Well, it gives us hope because death is something that, for many of us, we're like, well, what is death? That's, that's kind of an unknown. And there's a fear that happens there. That, that unknown. What happens after death? Is this life the end? And on this Easter Sunday, I want us to think about the fact that for those who believe the scriptures, we understand that Christ died and then was resurrected, proving that death isn't the end. In fact, we would say that Christ has boldly gone where no one had gone before. He was like, I mean, I don't want to be crude here or anything like that, but it's like a Star Trek Christ who he went where none had gone before. And he came back giving us a great hope. And that's a fantastic thing for us to celebrate on this Easter Sunday. Think about this for a minute. Mankind as a whole. When we look at history and things that's happened in the past and the way we've lived our lives and some of the changes that's come across, what is it that we learn from history? I had my nephew ask me that one time. He was back at our home area there, and he was talking to my father-in-law, and he shot out across the room, and he said, Hey, Dana, what do we learn from history? And I kind of chuckled. He had a grin on his face. I knew it was a kind of a trick question a little bit. But the correct answer to that, and I shouted back, was, was nothing. We don't learn anything from history. And it's true. Mankind, we really don't learn much from history. If you were to study back 102 years ago to the Spanish flu pandemic that swept the world... You would see that many of the things that we're doing today were the same things they were doing then. Churches were being closed. Businesses were being closed. People were wearing, were wearing masks everywhere, trying to stay clean, trying to separate. All that was happening 102 years ago. And now here it is happening again. We're like, man, this has never happened before. Well, yes, it has. This has happened before. But, you know, we forget history. We do. There are things that we don't like to think about that's happened in the past that we kind of... We, we forget it, we ignore it. Think about, for example, the Holocaust. There are many out there, even dignitaries, really, who are, who are trying to deny that the Holocaust ever occurred. 
that the extermination of millions of Jews, they would say, actually never happened. It was just made up. Even though there's tons of evidence proving otherwise, they want to deny the Holocaust. Something even more recently was the genocides that happened in Rwanda. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed, and yet it was ignored for the most part by the world. There was something happening, there was a truth that was around us, but we were ignoring that truth because we are good at ignoring or forgetting really what is not convenient for us. We are, and on Easter for many of us, it's the same way. We can ignore or forget really what's inconvenient for us. And so, yeah, on this issue, you say, well, Pastor, I'm here. I'm not ignoring anything. All right, but what happens tomorrow on Monday and Tuesday and the next Sunday, the Sunday following that? Are we ignoring something that's historical? Are we ignoring something that's not convenient for us? You know, in today's world, there are many that believe that God does not exist. They want to believe that truth, that God does not exist, and there is no right or wrong. There's no good or evil. You sit and think about it. If there is good, then that means there is a standard. All right? And so good is one of those things. In order for there to be good, there has to be a standard. And what is the standard? Well, when you look at mankind and, and history over the years, that standard has consistently changed according to cultures. What's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But the one standard for the church is the scriptures, and that standard has remained the same. We have a standard that doesn't change. That standard comes from God. The idea of right or wrong comes from God. We have this idea that there's really nothing after death. That the life that you have right now is the best life you're going to get. So live it to the fullest. That's something that we as a culture want to believe. Or we teach it, yeah, I believe Jesus existed. Absolutely, I believe he existed, but he was just another good person. There, he wasn't really God. There wasn't that much special about him. And there are religions and there are faiths that teach that. Jehovah Witnesses do not teach that Jesus was God. Muslims do not teach that Jesus was God. They believe he was just a good man. That's what they believe. So this idea of Christ being God for them is just an inconvenient truth. They don't like that idea. And maybe today you're sitting here on Easter and you say, well, yeah, I believe Jesus existed. But he was just another good person, a good teacher, whatever it was. But I don't really believe he was God and I don't believe he had the power to do what he said he did. But let's talk about that for just a minute. What was it that Christ said he could do? Because he made some pretty incredible claims. Let's think about this for just a second from the perspective of, of imagining Christ as a human and nothing more than that. Just a human. What would you think of a human who claimed he could forgive sins? If somebody met you in the street and they said, look, I have the power to forgive sins. I have the power to grant eternal life. What would you think of that person? You'd be like, whoa, dude, where is the paddy wagon, right? We'd be thinking, and look at what Christ claimed. In Luke chapter 5, verse 20. When he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, they had that same tension. Right? Here's this man, this person walking among us, who says that he can forgive sins. And this doesn't make sense to us. How can a man forgive sins? How can we say that Christ is a good man if Christ said something and taught something and believed something and acted upon something that wasn't true? How can we say he's just a good man? And not only that, Christ also said that he was the only way to God. The only way to God. In John chapter 14, verse 6, we read these words. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, nobody goes to heaven except through me. Now, what kind of person believes that? Some of you who are older may remember the Jim Jones thing that happened over in Africa. Horrible, this man leading hundreds of people to their deaths, believing he was the Messiah. And yet, Jim Jones was just a person. We would not say that he was a good person. We would not say that he was a good teacher. Did he have charisma? Sure, absolutely he did. Doesn't mean he was a good person. And yet here we are saying Christ is a good person and he's making some of the same claims. Do you see the intellectual dishonesty that we have here? Are we willing to be intellectually honest with ourselves? 
about the reality that, okay, either Christ was who he said he was, or Christ was nuts. There's no other way. Christ claimed that he would die and then come back to life. Well, what person, what human being would claim that? In Luke chapter 18, Jesus says this. He says, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, will be mocked and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise. Now, if you met somebody on the street who was, getting, who was being arrested, getting ready to be arrested, and he's holding off and said, yep, they're going to beat me here in just a little bit. They're going to nail me to the cross. They're going to kill me. But three days later, I'm going to come back from the dead. What would you think about that person? Like, holy cow. Please take him away, right? And yet somehow, in our minds, we just think, well, he was a good person. And we're okay with that. We don't want to think about the fact that he had to be who he said he was in order to be a good person. Because that there is really the very first inconvenient truth that mankind has, has avoided. You see, he was more than just a good person. C.S. Lewis said it very well. He said it this way. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. He goes on to say, you must take your choice. Either this was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Either Christ was insane, or Christ was human and God at the same time. The Apostle Paul recognized this tension. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes this great defense of Christ and the resurrection. Because he says, they think, okay, yeah, he promised her to die and then be resurrected, but, but what in the world? Who could even do that? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, we read these words. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, how can you say that this life is all that there is? There is nothing beyond this life. Paul says, if Christ is resurrected, then how can you say there is nothing more than this? Let's go on. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. That's a good point. If, if we are not going to be resurrected, if there is no resurrection at all, then, then Christ himself told a lie. And he himself was not truly resurrected. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So what I'm doing up here right now on this morning, if Christ has not been resurrected, it's, it's, it's foolishness in reality. What I believe about this book is, is foolishness. We are found even to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. So we're lying about who God is. Yeah, God has power to do this, but the reality is God didn't do it. And so, so now God doesn't have the power and we're just sitting here relying. Do you see the tension here? And if Christ has not been raised, well, for if the dead are not, I'm sorry, verse 16. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Everybody who, who dies is, is dead. That's it. There's no more. <laughs> if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. I love that. Paul says, look, if the resurrection didn't really happen, and we're hoping in something that didn't happen, we, more than anybody else in this world, should be pitied. We should be, we should be absolutely pitied. And so I ask you today, if, if you're struggling with this fact of Christ being, being God, being one who could take away the sins of the world, if you're wrestling with that a little bit, I'm asking, why are you kind of on this Sunday joining up with a bunch of people who, who are nothing more than should be pitied, really? Unless, of course, what they believe is true. And what they believe is true, then, then why are you wrestling, really? I mean, let's sit and think about it. 
it, it, there's some decisions in our life that seems like, okay, if that's true, then I'd be, I'd be foolish not to do that. And so I'm asking you again to be intellectually honest with yourself. As you sit and think about Christ, if you have any doubts at all about Christ, being a man, and also being God, then ask, why am I even here today? Why am I associating with a group of nutty people if what, I, if, if what they believe isn't true, then these guys are just nuts? Why are you part of that? You're kind of wasting your time just as I'm wasting my time. But the thing is, here's the deal. The very next verse that Paul writes is this. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Christ has been raised from the dead. And so for those of you who may not fully believe this, you're here out of maybe curiosity. Maybe because somebody's forcing you to come. I don't know what it is, but, but maybe nothing more than curiosity. And you're here and you're, and you're listening to this and you think, well, I don't know if I believe it or not. Well, Paul says, look, the truth is, he has been raised from the dead. And then Paul goes on to write, he says, for as by a man came death. This is talking about Adam. By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. Now he's talking about Christ. For what? For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. My hope is that because Christ was a person and did die, but, but as God in the form of a person came back to life, proving there's a resurrection, and then giving me the power to be resurrected myself, now I have hope. So to summarize what Paul's writing here, he's saying, look, Paul says, if I'm wrong, if there isn't a resurrection, if this whole idea of Easter is just a farce, listen to this. He said, Paul says, you guys should pity us. Lock us up, throw us away, throw away the key, whatever, just pity us. Because the reality is my whole life is a lie and I've even lied about who God is and his power. And the reality is I have no hope. I think I have hope, but I don't have hope. I'm never going to see my loved ones again. Whatever I do now is, is the best I'm going to get. This is it. It doesn't get any better than this. And the whole idea of Resurrection Sunday is just a big joke. And why am I taking part in something that's just a big joke? I'm just fooling myself. I've drank the Kool-Aid. Paul says that's the reality if, if I'm wrong, if there is no resurrection. You know, there are people in this world that, while I may not go to them for theological guidance, sometimes they nail it. Sometimes they, they say something and you're like, man, that's really well said. Bono from the band U2. Well, again, I wouldn't go to him necessarily as my pastor, as a shepherd. He said something one time that I really enjoyed. His quote is this, he said, I find it hard to accept that whole millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years have been touched, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. Bona said, look, he was at least intellectually honest in understanding either Jesus was nuts or Jesus really was who he said he was. That's intellectual honesty. And I'm asking you to be intellectually honest today. Because, of course, the, the reality for me here is what I understand through the scriptures is that I am right. And because I'm right, I, frankly, I pity you. Why? Because your whole life is a lie. And you've even lied about God. And you're the one who has no hope. What you're going through here, yeah, this is the best you're going to get. Because someday it's going to get a whole lot worse for you after death. And you will never see your loved ones again. And for you, Resurrection Sunday should be scary. But the fact that there is a resurrection. And someday you are coming back from the grave. And what are you going to do when you stand before God? And say, well, God, I didn't really think you were real. And I didn't really think your son was real. And sorry, and can I get another chance? And God says, no, there is no other chance. Because the scriptures... What I believe is true, I've got to be honest and pity you. Last week in my message, I told a short story about my grandfather who was injured when he was 78 years old. He was backed over by a semi-trailer, torn up really bad. And I had a lot of questions about God during that time. Why would God let that happen to my grandfather? In the middle of that hard time, my grandfather picked up a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. Somebody gave him a copy of that book, What's So Amazing About Grace. And my grandfather learned for the first time this unconditional love of God. He had never heard before that there is nothing you can do to make God love you more or love you less than he does right now. 
He'd never heard that truth. But that's a true statement. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or love you less than he does right now. God has already sent his son Jesus to die for you. Does it get much better than that? There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or love you less than he does right now. My grandfather, learned, my grandfather really learned what it means to have a close relationship with God. My grandfather was changed by that. For the first time, I heard my grandfather tell me that he personally loved me. I became close to him. In fact, he was the best man at my wedding two years after his accident. My grandfather learned what it means to have a relationship with God. My grandfather since passed on, but because of the resurrection, because of my grandfather's faith, I know that I'm going to see him again. So for me, today is a reminder that the resurrection's occurred and that someday I'm going to be with not just Jesus, but my family. It's going to be exciting to see Jesus. I'm going to love to see Jesus. And frankly, when I see Jesus, I may not even think to say hi to my grandfather. But that's a hope. And I want to tell you, you can have that hope too. You can, the hope is for you. But do you understand what the scriptures are saying? You know, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And the last half says this, And your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. The reality of the truth of scripture here is, is that we've all sinned and we all deserve to be separated from God. None of us deserve to be with him. You know, Mark Twain read some of his books. Let me, you gotta love Mark Twain. Mark Twain said this. He said, most people are bothered by those passages of scripture which they cannot understand. And I get that. There are passages of scripture that I don't understand that they bother me. But again, in his intellectual honesty, he says this. He said, but as for me, I've always noticed that the passages of scripture which bother me the most are those which I do understand. Romans 3.23 is pretty clear. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. That should bother all of us. That should. That's pretty clear. There should be a little nudge in there thinking, wow, okay. And then Romans 6.23, again, a very clear passage says the ways of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, that's pretty clear. The wages of sin is death. Let's go back to that Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the very next verse? And are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, Christ Jesus, again, being God, can offer us redemption. He can forgive sins. Because he was more than just a good teacher. He was God himself. And I have redemption. There's a pastor by the name of Tim Keller. Tim Keller said this way. He said, you know what? He says, we think about ourselves and who we are. Think about the sins we have in our lives. He said, even in the middle of all that, so you are more sinful than you have ever believed. When you think about the sins in your own life, the reality is we don't remember every sin we've committed. And so we are more sinful than we've ever believed. <laughs> but the great thing about Resurrection Sunday and Easter, we get to remember this, is that you are more loved than you ever dared hope. You are more loved than you ever dared know. God loves you so much. Romans chapter 5 says, But God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were God's enemies, and Christ died for us. That's love. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We've been saved by God's grace through faith. Through believing that the scripture is true, through being intellectually honest with ourselves, recognizing that either Christ was nuts or Christ was God. And if Christ was God, then I had better place my faith in him. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 16, 31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1 says, the fool says there is no God. The fool says there is no God. Where are you at? Are you ready to believe that there is a God? In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus speaking, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come to judgment, but he's passed from death into life. That person has eternal life. It's not shall have or maybe shall have, or if you jump through the right hoops, you're going to get it. It's no, whoever, believe, whoever hears my word and believes. 
Today I've spoken the word of God. Verses directly from God's word. The question I have for you is, do you believe? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. For God so loved the world, you are loved more than you ever dare hope by a God who's provided a resurrection, a future resurrection for all of us. Are you ready to choose Christ? It was at this time of the service that I planned on bringing communion, taking a shared communion together. We're going to have the elements out there, individually wrapped elements for people to, to take as they come into the parking lot at the fairgrounds. And everybody take communion together. Remembering the blood that was shed for us represented in the juice and his body broken for us represented in the pieces of bread. Obviously, today we are not together to be able to do that. If, if you'd like to do that right now, you're more than welcome to do so as a family. Just pouring a little juice and talking to, your, to those with you about how this is just a reminder of Christ's blood shed and, and the bread is his body broken for us. Because Christ did make those sacrifices for us. For those listening today for, who've already made that decision to choose Christ. And choosing Christ, I want to tell you this, choosing Christ isn't, there's not a song and dance you have to do. There's not exact words you have to say. There's not money you have to give. There's not dancing. There's nothing like that. It's nothing more than saying than just saying to God in your mind, out loud, however it works for you. God, I believe that your son was God. And I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he's offered me eternal life. Would you give me that gift? Would you take away my sins? So I can have that gift of redemption. After the communion was going to be shared, I was going to read something for the believers. There's something that happens to us. Actually, several somethings that happen to us the moment we believe in Christ. Lewis Berry Schaefer, who's president of the Dallas Theological Seminary for many years down in Dallas. He wrote this. He said, there's 35 things that happen the moment we trust in Christ's Son. I want to share these 35 things for you. As a believer, if you're already a believer, these are things that God has done for you the moment you place your faith in Him. On this Resurrection Sunday, these are things we should be celebrating. Not just the fact that Christ is alive. That's huge. Absolutely. But look what Christ has done for us. We are justified. Declared right. We are forgiven by God. We've been redeemed by his death. We are now related to God. Part of his family. We have been made acceptable to God. We are reconciled to God. And we are permanently joined. Catch that? Permanently joined to the love of God. We are sanctified. We have become righteous in God's eyes. No longer does our sin separate us because our sins are no more. <laughs> because of what Christ has done. We have died in Christ, but we've also been raised in Christ. We've been made alive. We have circumcised hearts. We have eternal life and we are alive to God. We have become a new creation intended for good works. We are made part of God's inheritance. We are made God's inheritance. I'm sorry. We are made God's inheritance. We are made a demonstration of God's wisdom to spiritual powers, and we will show the riches of God's grace in the ages to come. We're related to God under the new covenant. We've been brought near to God in his covenants. We are experiencing the promised blessings to Abraham. We are chosen by God to be holy and blameless. We are part of the body of Christ. We are fellow heirs with the Jews. We are free from the law of the old covenant. We have every spiritual blessing in heaven. We are seated in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. We have a holy calling. We are delivered from the powers of darkness. We are complete. We have bold access to God. There's a special comfort provided to us. We now have a certainty of resurrection. And we will also be adopted heirs to the praise of God's grace. And we were promised a great reward if we run well. That reward, of course, is rewards in heaven if we run well. Getting to heaven is faith in Christ. What I do on this earth, 
as my rewards. 35 things that happen the moment I place my faith in Christ. On this Easter Sunday, I celebrate the fact <laughs> that I'm reconciled to God, that I'm permanently joined to his love. I celebrate that I have eternal life and that I'm alive to God. These are some of my favorites. I'm not going to choose all of these, but some of my favorites. I love the fact that I have been justified and forgiven by God, and I celebrate that. And I'm now related to God. I'm part of his family. I'm part of the body of Christ. How amazing is that? What are you going to celebrate today as a believer? Go back through, listen to that list again. Which one of those things jumps out at you? Which, which, several, which ones of them jump out at you? Say, man, that's awesome. What a thing to celebrate on Easter Sunday. All because you chose Christ. Who is a good and loving God. Come to earth as a man but offering eternal life for all who believe. What an amazing God. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us and for his willingness and obedience to die for us. God, I praise you that we're going to have eternal life in him for the hope that we have. Thank you, God, for this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. You have a blessed Easter, and I pray that God spoke through you through this message.